Good evening, good evening. It's about 6.22, about 6.23. Uh, welcome to our New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church uh, Bible study question and answer period. Uh, for those that may not know me, my name is Pastor Rodney Smith. I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church where God has blessed me to be for over 13 years now. And we normally come on just a bit early. We get started at 6.30. And we do that so the members and friends and guests and maybe people who are just coming on for the first time, we can all greet one another, say hello, and kind of get acquainted after this, uh, these strange times that we're living in, in isolation, and it's because of our safety. Uh, tonight we have a very good subject that's going to take up all of our time, and so I will ask you to please get your Bibles and make sure you follow along with us, study along with us, that way you'll be able to you know, follow and grasp what we're talking about. Uh, good evening to all of you as you as you log on. We see you, Jamario Tidwell, Norwood Tidwell. Good good evening to you, Sister Kathy Turner. God bless you, and we still want to keep you lifted in prayer on the loss and the grief that you're going through. You know, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal, and I can tell you the words that help get me through. You know, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Certainly that same goes out to you, Sister Waller, on the passing of your sister. Uh, we've got the information for the funeral situation we're going to give out in just a few minutes. But Sister uh, Waller, let me tell you that I've been young, and David said I done messed around and then got old. And through it all, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So I just want to say to you, God will take care of you. Hey, Andre Bird, I see you. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good to have you with us tonight. Uh, and so we certainly want to keep all of us in prayer. Uh, and so as we log on, we just want to say, oh, no, no problem, Sister Turner. Just want to give you all a chance to, to greet one another. I want you to be in your Bible. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22 tonight. So go ahead and turn your Bible there and we'll go ahead and, and get started with everything. But there's a couple of things to, to claim our attention. Uh, the first one is regarding our own choir president, uh, Sister Waller, uh, and the passing of her sister. Uh, they're going to have online services this Saturday at 11 a.m. Once again, online services this Saturday at 11 a.m. And you can look up on Facebook. I believe it's Mariana Funeral Home. That way you'll be able to participate, at least to show your support in that way. And uh, Sister Waller, our hearts and our prayers go out to you. We certainly want to keep you lifted in prayer. Uh, it's, you know, as I often said, everybody's going through something. You know, it seems like you just can't win for losing, but we certainly want to keep you in our prayers. And we pray that all of you will keep her lifted in your prayers as well. Sister Cheryl Brown, good evening to you. Sister Turner, good evening to you. Good to have everyone uh, logged on, tuning in with us tonight. I can tell you, in, in spite of everything that goes on, you know, I'm still in a, in a good mood. I'm in an unusually good mood today. Sometimes you just have to pause in spite of everything that you go through and everything that you see and deal with. It's just good to just stop and say, thank you, Lord. Uh, Sister Tim, bless you. It's just good to stop and say, Lord, if it hadn't been for you, you know, where would I be? So we, we do have some good news we want to share with you tonight. One of those things is one of our own. Uh, we know her sister, Natasha Timms. Uh, her, Pastor Timms, First Lady of New Hope uh, Baptist Church. If I'm understanding correctly, she has won Teacher of the Year for the second year in a row, which is no small feat, working with our children. I call them America's Future. So if you get a chance, uh, congratulate her, send her a message or a text. Just tell her that you're thankful and you, you're happy for her. And we have another one. I see to the good sister, Sister Burnett. Good evening to you, you and your husband. Good to have you guys with us tonight. Another one comes via the school system. I talked about the good sister. I'm going to say I'm going to talk about the other sister. Amen. Sister Nakia Morris, employed by PCSSD. She is a paraprofessional. Took me a long time to get that. She is now, now, if I say this wrong, Sister Morris, 
Please don't send me a mean text because I know that you will. Amen. If I say this wrong, Sister Moore, she is a certified intervener. I hope I said that right. Anyway, she is the first in the state of Arkansas to accomplish this feat. So kudos to her. Congratulations. Thank the Lord for her. We, we certainly are appreciative for her and, and thankful for what she has done. She's the first in the state. And I heard it say it this way in Pine Bluff. That's some tall cotton right there. So good job to Sister Timms and to our very own Sister Morris. You know, job well done. We salute you and we thank you for all that you have accomplished. And we know that it's nobody but the Lord that can help you, you know, get to where you are. And we do know this. With the Lord, there's always higher heights. There's always greater accomplishment. Where you are is not where you're going when you hold on to God's unchanged hand. So we'll ask you tonight also to remember, Lord willing, on the fourth Sunday, which is February the 28th at 3 p.m., uh, um, Pastor Buchanan from Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, 1200 Hanger Hill, he's asked me to come and to be the guest speaker for their annual Black History Program. For those who are able and for those who are willing to get out in the midst of these circumstances, we'll invite you to come. For those who are not yet comfortable, for those who are still a bit more cautious, you know your body, you know your medical history better than any one of us. If you stay home and are unable to come or just want to play it safe, listen, we certainly won't put our head down for you. In these times, we certainly understand. Amen, somebody. Amen. So. With all that being put behind us, we're going to have prayer beginning in just a few minutes, well, in just a minute here. And one thing that we know, the only way to teach people to be on time is to begin on time. So Sister Morris, we, we thank you to Sister uh, Timms, to Sister Natasha Timms. I know she will get the word out to her. I'm sure she's supporting Pastor Timms as he's teaching Bible study tonight. And so at 630 we're going to begin with prayer, and we'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, which is where we're going to study for tonight for about 25, 30 minutes or so. So if you don't mind, if you can take a moment just to pause, um, and let's, let's say a word of prayer. Uh, let, let, let's pray together. Uh, Father, we come before you, and we are humbled in your presence. God, we are thankful to you for all of your many benefits all of your favor, all of your blessing, all of your provision for health and for strength, for shelter, for clothing, for food, for all of the common grace that you shared in our lives every day. Father, we're grateful for all that you've done and for all that you're even doing right now. As we're about to study your word, we pray, Lord, that you can make us willing hearers, that you can make us willing doers, that we won't just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Help us, Father, when we see truth, to be obedient to it, to follow after truth, Father, to be devoted to you, no matter what or who it cost us, knowing that in the end, our goal is to give your, our, that our lives can give you glory. And we ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen and amen again. Amen and amen again. We thank the Lord for all of you tonight. Um, our key verse, well, I won't give you that first. I'll give you the question. I've told you the Bible book and chapter, Luke chapter 22. But because this is Bible study, you will need your Bibles. Uh, we have one book and chapter that's going to be our main focus of study. However, we will have other parts of the Bible that we will look at to help support the point that we're trying to show in Scripture. And let me say this, I'm appreciative to all of you who submit your question, some personally, some via the email, some via text, some call me. Uh, I appreciate you trusting this church and trusting myself uh, to answer your question. It is humbling. Uh, Lord knows there is nothing that I will say or any direction I will point you in that will deliberately push you in the wrong direction. Uh, one of the ways, because I'm, I do pastor full time, but I also work full time. One of the ways that I have found that has been a beneficial way of study has been the question and answer format. 
And one thing that I have noticed uh, with so many people with a larger ministry lining up to ask a question regarding the Bible or some spiritual uh, situation, they don't have time in that forum to give a long, exhaustive answer. They have to condense it in a sense. Well, we have the ability in this format to where we can take one question and sometime two, and we can give you a bit more in-depth Bible study or in-depth answer that can even open the door to your own Bible study. The end goal is to have the question answered and hopefully to spark your own personal time of study that way you can search the scriptures yourself, like the book of Acts said, like the noble Bereans who searched the scriptures to see if these things were true. So tonight is a very practical, very relevant question. And I want to make sure I get it right. Um, many people, uh, based on Luke chapter 22 and 36, six, have used this as justification uh, to purchase a gun. And so from this chapter, from this verse, what does the Bible have to say about physical defense, about self-defense, about protecting your home, about uh, uh, taking care of your family versus the intruder? Are we as Christians to be pacifists? Uh, if that's the case, should we get into the military? What does the Bible say about these type of things? And so I want us to look into God's word uh, to find an exhaustive answer. Uh, to this question tonight. So we're going to arrive at Luke chapter 22 and verse 36, but you can't just turn to Luke 22 and 36 and pluck it from the surrounding verses. If you take a text from the surrounding text, you can actually make it say what you want it to say. So we must study the Bible in context. Here's the phrase for tonight, context, context, context. So how do we get to Luke chapter 22 and 36? The lead up to helps set the scene, uh, helps give us the background and the conversation. So in Luke chapter 22, we're going to give kind of an overarching view of what this uh, chapter is talking about. Now, we know Luke is the beloved physician. Uh, Luke writes in very great detail. Luke has the eye of a physician to where some gospels may say this individual had leprosy. But Luke, who's a doctor, who's a physician, Luke said he was full of leprosy, meaning it was full blown leprosy. This wasn't the beginning stages, the infant stages. Luke would be more descriptive than the other Bible writers in many cases because of his occupation. So in Luke chapter 22, this chapter in essence is talking about how the religious leaders in this chapter, they agree to kill Jesus. Luke 22 tells you that the overarching theme, the enemies of Jesus, the religious leaders, they now in this chapter, they agree to kill Jesus. In verses one and two, it's just a general understanding, verse 1 and 2. It talks about this is the time of the Passover. If you're familiar with the Passover, the book of Exodus, when God said, take the lamb, uh, uh, a, a young lamb uh, with under three years old, kill it, put his blood on your side posts and the upper posts, and every house that's covered their doorposts with the blood of this lamb, when I send my death angel, which is the 10th plague that's going to break the back of Pharaoh. If that house has the blood of the lamb applied the way I say it, he's going to pass over. Centuries later, they're still commemorating that event where God emancipated them from Egypt. So it's the time of the Passover. In verses three through six, this section talks to us about how Judas agrees to betray Jesus. In verses 7 to 13, the disciples get 
prepared for the Passover. In verses 14 to 30, Jesus and the disciples, they actually enjoy or uh, have or share the Passover meal. And then we slow down just a little bit. In verses 31 to 38, this is where Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Now we're going to slow down just a little bit because we're trying to get to verse 36. So in verses 31 to 38 of Luke 22, this is where Jesus predicts that Peter, you're going to deny me. You can also find this same story told in all four gospels, Matthew 26, Mark chapter 14, and in John chapter 13. So in Luke chapter 22, we're going to start in verse 31. In that verse is when Peter comes to Jesus and Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked permission for you that he can sift you like wheat. That understanding lets us know we in and of ourselves are no match for Jesus. Oh, excuse me, for Satan. Of course, we're no match for Jesus. We in, in and of ourselves, in our own strength, our own little spiritual mind, our own little spiritual strength, we are not strong enough to fight Satan on our own. He would sift us like wheat is sifted in, uh, into flour. It, 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 we would be no match for him. So Jesus says to Peter, Satan has asked for you that he can sift you like wheat. Let me have him, Jesus. Give me permission because he got to get permission. God will only allow him to go so far. But if you give me a little bit of permission, I tear him up. So in our prayers, whether it be in church services, you don't have to pray this prayer. I've heard it done before. It's not biblical. You don't have to say, come on, Satan. Give me all you got. I'm going to stomp your head out. First of all, he coming whether you want him to or not. Second of all, you ain't going to stomp his head out. Without Christ, we are no match for Satan. Verse 34, but Jesus said, he's asked for you, but verse, excuse me, verse 32, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. That, that's encouraging for us to know that Jesus is invested in the affairs of our lives. Jesus cares about us. He cares about us. He loves us. He prays for us. He has our best interests in heart. Verse 33, Peter responds to what Jesus has just said. He said, I'll follow you to prison or I'll follow you to death. I'll follow you if it costs me my liberty. I'll follow you if it costs me my life. Now listen to me. That's a tall order. And we've all been there. You feel so emboldened by the Holy Spirit, so devoted to God, and there's nothing wrong with it. You feel like you can rush hell with a water gun. I'm ready. Well, well that, that's good. But there will come a time to where the rubber will meet the road. So we see Peter's response. It doesn't matter what it costs me. I'll follow you if it costs me my freedom or if it costs me my life. And Jesus responds in verse 34. He said, Peter, let me tell you something. You're going to deny me. You're going to deny that you even know who I am before the sun rises. Now listen, as well-intentioned as Peter is, Jesus predicts, prophesies. He can see tomorrow. He can see two days down the road. He knows the future. And he said, Peter, let me tell you something. You're not going to hold up your end of the bargain. I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. I hear this tall order, this heavy claim of devotion to me. You'll follow me no matter what. But let me go ahead and tell you, not trying to deflate you, but let me just tell you, I know what you don't know. In other words, I know more about you, Peter, 
thing you know about yourself, you're not going to be able to hold up under the pressure that you're about to be placed under. You're going to deny even knowing me. In one hand, on one hand, you're saying, guess what, Jesus? I'll follow you no matter what. That's how strong my devotion is. Jesus says, nighttime now, before the sun rises, you will have denied that you even know who I am before the cock crows. Now, now, I want to pause for a minute. Jesus knows what will come about. God, now, now we, we, we see what the scripture says. We see the interpretation. Let's make an application. God knows what will happen. God has all knowledge. If God says something is going to happen Thursday at 3 o'clock, it won't be Friday at 2.30. It won't be Sunday at 2.15. If God says it, it's going to come to pass because he has all knowledge. So when you have people who profess to be speaking on behalf of God and they say, God told me, here's who's going to win the election. God told me, here's how long COVID is going to last. God told me the end of the world is coming in such and such date. And if it doesn't happen, they're lying. They would be what the Bible calls a false prophet. Because if God tells you something's going to happen, God knows what's going to happen. The same way Peter just said, man, I'll follow you no matter what. Jesus said, no, you won't. And those of us who are familiar with this scenario, this situation with Peter, he didn't stay with you. He denied him just like Jesus said. So that's just another application. Now, now we got to look at, before we get to verse 36, we got to look at verse 35. And only Luke's account has these instructions. Well, why is that? As I said earlier, Luke is a physician. Luke has an eye of detail because you want your doctor to be able to see everything as he looks at in our time, not Luke's, but in our time as he examines your blood work, as he looks at your x-ray, as they hold your elbow out and look at your arm, you want them to be able to see what the average person might miss. Why? Because if they miss something regarding your health, that could cost you your life. And that same set of responsible eyes is what Luke brings to being a gospel writer. So Luke only has this account of what verse 35 says, Luke 22 and verse 35. And he said to them, when I sent you out without money or bag or shoes, this is very important to interpret in verse 36, verse 35. When I sent you out without money or bag or shoes, were you in need of anything? And they said, nothing. Now that's the Bible in basic English. I'm going to read it in the King James Version. Many of you may have that. Verse 35. And he said to them, when I sent you without purse, without a bag or script, and shoes, lacked ye anything? Did you lack anything when I sent you out the first time? And they said, we didn't lack anything. Now, that phrase in verse 35, and he said to them, Jesus just finished a discourse with Peter. Peter, you're going to deny me. No, 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 I'll follow you. No, Peter, you're going to deny me. Now he says to them, Jesus now turns his focus to all of the disciples, not just Peter. Now, verse 35, he's not just speaking privately, silently to Peter. He's speaking to all of them. Sister McCall, he's speaking to all of them. So he's not just speaking to Peter. He says, when I sent you without purse, without script, without shoes. Did you lack anything? Here's what Jesus is doing when he asked this rhetorical question. Jesus is reminding them 
of all of their past evangelistic tours and how they didn't lack anything because they were favorably treated. You can find that in Luke chapter nine, verses one to six, when Jesus sent them out by twos to 70. That's one of the times. Don't take your purse. Don't take script. You ain't got to take nothing. Why? Because listen, when you go out there, everything is going to be all right. And if they don't receive you, dust your feet off, feet off and move to the next location. Don't worry about it. You've given them the gospel. I'm sending you to the lost sheep of Israel. So Jesus is saying in Luke chapter nine, verses one through six, remember the last time I sent you out? I told you, don't take anything for provision. Now you trusted me and you did what I said do. How'd that turn out for you? Did you miss anything? Did you lack anything? Did you come up with any want? Were there any needs that were not met? And the answer is no, we didn't need anything. We didn't need anything. Now we get to verse 36. You see how the context is important here. Now in verse 36, Luke 22 and 36, then he said to them, but now he that has a purse, a bag, let him take it. And likewise, his script. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. I'm going to read this in what's called the Bible in basic English. It's very akin to what's called the living Bible. Luke 22 and 36. Now he says to them, he who has a money bag or a bag for food, let him take it. And he who has not, don't have that, let him give his coat for money and get a sword. And based on Luke 22 and 36, Many people have said, hey, listen, Jesus said, take a weapon. Hey, listen, Jesus said, take a sword. So is this to mean every Christian is supposed to have a gun? Am I supposed to join the NRA? It's not illegal to have a firearm uh, as long as you meet certain conditions. I don't know all of them. Some of you may be more well-versed in this area than I do. But I guess if you have a certain police record, maybe you can't, things of that nature. But there are legal means to get a gun. So to have a gun is not illegal. You're not breaking the law of the land. But what does the Bible say about self-defense based on this? Is it, is it okay to protect yourself? Or does that mean I'm not trusting God? So let's examine what verse Luke 22 and 36 is talking about. What Jesus is doing now in this verse, in, in, in the previous verse, verse 35, Jesus describes how everything was provided for you. But now he's saying, when I send you out, things are going to be different. There's going to be some difficult days that lie ahead. Well, why would it be different then as opposed to now? Because Christ is closer to his death. And because the nation has rejected Christ, the nation will also no longer welcome those that follow Christ. Pause right there. Let's make an application from that interpretation. We, we, we see the interpretation. Let's make an application. We talked briefly about this in part Sunday from our Sunday school lesson, how Jesus was criticized by the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. They called him a lie. They insulted him by calling him a Samaritan. They said that he's possessed with a demon. He's demon possessed. You have a demon inside of you. That's why you're talking the way you talk. So the same way the world rejects Jesus, the nation in this case rejected Jesus, the same way the nation is going to reject the followers, the disciples of Jesus. Friends, that carries on to today. I'm making an application from our Bible interpretation. There is no way that you're going to live for the Lord, pray, read your Bible, do what the Bible said, be a godly wife, be a godly husband, be a young person that follows the Lord and live in this world that rejects Christ and go unscathed. It, it will not happen. It cannot happen. It will not happen. So the question that I want to pose before you, 
I'm asking this rhetorically. Just think about this in your mind. The question is not why are you suffering? Well, we know why you're suffering. When you live for Christ, this world, the same way it rejects his teaching, it will reject those that follow his teaching. So the question is not why are you suffering? The question before the house for every sincere Christian is why aren't you suffering? Because there's no way you can wear all blue in a neighborhood that represents all red and be at peace with everybody. Don't happen that way. And in a spiritual way, godly way, biblical way, heavenly way, there's no way you can live for the king of kings and lord of lords in a world that has fallen away from him and be at peace with everybody. Yes, you will have good days. Yes, you will make friends. Yes, you will, you know, have people that you find things in common with. But in general, you cannot be at total peace in a world that rejects Christ when you follow Christ. So that's what Christ is transitioning to. And so when he says he that has a purse, take it. And likewise, a script or a bag, a, a, it's like a traveler's bag, a food bag. He's saying in verse 36, when he lists these items, from now on, the disciples will need to take their own supplies. Be prepared. Now, the, the, the portion in question, reading from the King James Version, Luke 22 and 36, he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. They didn't have guns. We know that. They didn't have the modern, you know, weaponry that we possess. I think everyone is aware of that. Their weapon would be a sword. Carrying a sword would be equivalent to carrying a gun or carrying a sword. It wasn't a long sword like Game of Thrones. It was a dagger. Carrying a sword then, dagger then. I mean, there's some seniors that might have a little something in their purse for you right now. You run up on them. <laughs> carrying a knife then, a weapon, it's like carrying a knife now, a weapon. So this instruction is kind of surprising considering some of the teaching of Jesus where he leads us to be kind of non-confrontational. So how in one hand is he going to say in Matthew 5 and 44, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do them that hate do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that spitefully misuse you and persecute you. How can he say that and then in turn say, sell what you have and get you a weapon? Or how can he say in Matthew 26 and 52, when Peter took out his sword in the garden of Gethsemane and cut off the ear of Malchus, a servant of the high priest, when he came to arrest Jesus and Jesus said, put away your sword. Because if you live by the sword, you are what? Somebody type it in for me. I want to know who reads that Bible. If you live by the sword, you will what? I want to see who the first one to get it up here. I know I know. I got a couple of Bible readers. It hasn't come in yet because of the lag in the internet speed. Die. Thank you, Sister Waller. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Sister Davis, Brother Tims, thank you for that. Sister Walla, I appreciate you. I know some of you who may not have typed it in, you know it. I'm sure Sister Tamia Tim, Sister Gardner, Sister Carolyn Turner. So, Peter, put away your sword. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Matthew 5, love your enemies. Bless them to curse you. And then you look at Luke 22 and 36. Hey, man, I'm sending y'all out. You might want to get that little 22 paraphrasing, putting it in a modern vernacular, modern mindset. I'm sending y'all out. Yeah, yeah. Y'all y'all finna go evangelize? What, what, 12th and Pine? Oh, okay. 15th and Lewis? Mm, okay. 15th and Oak? Yeah, yeah, you might wanna, you know, I'm just saying, you you might wanna, Sister Cam, you, you might wanna, yeah. So, see, so it seems like the teaching is, is like it's surprising considering other teachings that Christ has said. Now, here we go. Let me say this to you people. Um, I want it to be clear. I want it to be concise. 
I wanted to uh, not put my bias into it, my thoughts, my opinion. I've gone over this text so many times before, but just because you've gone over it so many times before, you don't ever want to get lazy. It's, it's funny how the mind works. You ever thought something like, no, 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 that, that, that car was red. And you, I mean, you would bet everything you had. That was a red car. And you pull it back up to the car lot. The car's green. Like, what in the world? We are flawed, fallible human beings. I didn't want to rest on my laurels because I've gone over this many times before. I said, let me make sure I get this, you know, stirred up in me again. Get my mind refreshed. And it jogged my memory. <sighs> there are two... Major interpretations, main interpretations of this. And one of them is more popular than the other. Let me say that. One interpretation of Luke twenty two thirty six, 36 and, and leading up to it when Jesus talks about get your sword, get your protection, get your weaponry, take your bag, take your food bag, get some money. If you ain't got a gun or sword, sell something and get one. One of the interpretations is Jesus is speaking metaphorically. He may not mean a literal sword. He's just saying, be prepared for what you're going to encounter because the world will reject you as the world has rejected me. Another interpretation, which is really the main two, he's not speaking metaphorically. The other interpretation people fall in, Jesus is speaking literally. No, nah, man, get that Glock 9. Get that 45. Get that knife. Get that protection. You're going out into a cold world, which brings us to the, I guess, the meat of our question, the climax, the center of our question, it, which is, I mean, if I get a gun, am I not trusting God? Or if I don't get a gun, am I tempting God? I mean, I'm not going to sleep with my door open, will you? Mm -mm. I'm going to look both ways before I cross the street, don't you? You wouldn't just buy a house with no locks on it and say, no, no, God got me. But if you put a lock on and dead bolts and a security door, and it may be pretty in glass, but that ain't glass. That's a security door. If you put that on your house, does that mean you don't trust God? Or if I get a gun, does that mean I don't trust? See, see, that's kind of where we come. Now, I'm going to tell you where, from what I've studied, which lines up with what most of other scholars have studied. Now, I, I, I went to, some of you may remember a website, a very good teaching website. It's called Precept Austin, like Austin, Texas, preceptaustin.org. It's enough Bible information. It's like trying to drink from a fire hose. You, you just can't take it all. And I wanted to just engulf myself and get other study material. And the overwhelming majority of scholars fall to where I tend to land, which is Jesus is not speaking metaphorically. Jesus is speaking literally. And there are other supportive scripture to let us know what the Bible has to say about self-defense. One of them I wanted to read it in the Living Bible. Uh, it's not the Living Bible. It's called the Bible in Basic English. It's a very good translation to help with the King James language. Proverbs chapter 25 and 26. Proverbs chapter 25 and 26. He said, just like a fountain, just like a troubled fountain and a dirty spring, that's the same as an upright man who has to give, give way before evildoers. That's like saying having dirty water or having a dirty spring. That's, that's not right. It's the same way for a righteous man to let an unrighteous man get away or to run over them or to push them over. Not saying that you're supposed to go looking for fights. But there is justice involved in what the Bible talks about when it comes to righteousness and unrighteousness. And for the unrighteous, Luke, excuse me, Proverbs 25 and 26, for the unrighteous to run over 
the righteous. That's like drinking from a dirty fountain or from a dirty spring. Luke 25 and 26. There's another text that speaks more directly to home invasion. Yes, in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. I'm going to read these yet again uh, in the version of the Bible called the Bible in basic English. Very close to what we would call the living Bible. And I want to do this to remove the whithersoever type language of the King James Version. Exodus chapter 22, verse 2 and 3. Verse 2, if a thief is taken in the act of forcing his way into the house and his death is caused by a blow, the owner of the house is not responsible for his blood. Exodus chapter 22, verse 2. Very plainly, Moses is saying, God is saying, listen, if, if it's nighttime and you wake up and you hear somebody breaking in your window and tipping in your door and you take in their time a stone or a sword or a spear in our time, you take a weapon, whether it's a bat, whether it's a knife, whether it is a gun and you defend your house and that person dies in the act of you trying to protect your family. He said, you're not responsible for that. His blood is not on your hand. Not at all. Not at all. And then verse three, but if it is after dawn, which is the sun is up in the morning, he will be responsible. Now, now, now pay attention. He's not saying it's okay to hurt somebody at night, but not in the daytime. It gives the idea of some surprise attack and it uses a surprise as in the night you're resting, you're unaware, you're comfortable and someone comes in and you protect yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. But if it's daytime, not meaning if it's literally day, more so the idea is if you have a time, if you have a moment to contemplate, to think, to sort this out and to find better me, hey, hey, get out of here, or to have an alternative way of handling the situation because it's not spur of the moment, middle of the night. It's a slow burn. You can see it coming. He said, you use another way. Don't, don't, don't do it that way. And so Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3, specifically verse 2. Now, here's what I will say. Revenge is prohibited in the Bible. It is prohibited. Now, I'm going to ask a very uh, rhetorical question. How many of us have ever felt the need the desire to want to get revenge on somebody. Hit me, I'm going to hit you back. Do wrong to me, I'm going to get you back. Get my sister, I'm getting your sister. Get my brother, I'm getting your brother. Talk about my spouse, I'm talking about your spouse. You, you messed up my business, I'm trying to get my business off the ground. You giving me bad reviews on purpose to bring me down? Guess what? I'm going to do the same thing to you. Revenge is prohibited in the Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. God will take care of your enemies. Nothing wrong with taking legal means to defend yourself and to protect yourself. But the Bible does not condone a get back attitude. Mm-mm. Okay. And, and I must be honest, the overwhelming lean of the New Testament, it is toward non-confrontational ways of handling a situation. But we have Luke 22 and verse 36, where Jesus said, if you ain't got a sword, you better sell something and get a sword. You're living in a cold world. We do have those practical things in the Bible when David went to fight Goliath and David went down in the Valley of Elah, how dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the Most High God? David didn't have to go find a slingshot. David already had a slingshot. I got mine with me. I'm going to get some bullets. In this case, I'm going to get a rock. He stopped by the river and got five smooth stones, but he didn't need but one. So to... To answer your question, I, I, I want to say this, and this may not be as dogmatic as some may want. You're not 
any stronger a Christian if you don't have a gun and you're not any weaker a Christian if you do have a gun. I do know this. God has never called us to be pacifists. Thank God we got the military. Thank God we have legal means of defending yourself and punishing intruders. Thank God we got the right to bear arms because I'm going to tell you something right now. This is this Pastor Smith talking. I might as well be, I am a human being. If I come home from work, working 40 hours a week, eight hours a day, and I didn't worked and saved and bought stuff, and somebody who ain't going to work, I find them tipping out my window with my belongings, we ain't finna pray. Mm -mm. I'm going to pray after that, but in that moment, I'm going to get back what belongs to me. If I'm in the house, and I'm sure many of you may feel the same way, and your door is locked, and your lights are out, and you're in the bed, and you're getting rest from a long day's work or from whatever's been going on, and somebody is jimmying your lock and pushing your door and kicking your door, and you don't know who it is, I'm not going to say who goes there. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to make sure that, you know, amen, that I take care of my family. Who wouldn't protect their spouse, their children, their parents? their belongings that God has blessed you with. I'm not finna say what the Bible said, you know, bless them to curse you. So I'll help you take the TV off the wall. Uh, yeah, yeah, you want the couch? Okay, I'll help you carry the couch out too. On oh, my wallet, matter of fact, just take my debit card, man. You can go, well, no. And, and if those who have another means will say, well, I'm not going to do that, but I don't think I need a gun. I'm going to pray. I'm going to trust God. Go. Go right ahead. The, it is at your discretion in, in, in that sense now. It is, at, it is at your discretion in that sense. It is at your discretion. If you say, you know what? I'm not comfortable having a firearm. I don't know how to shoot no firearm. I, I mean, I'd probably mess around and hurt myself before I hurt somebody. Else. I don't want to have no gun. Don't get one. You don't have to have one. But if you're of another persuasion and you say, you know what? I got some scriptures from Exodus, from Proverbs. We got Luke 22. We got other practical examples David had. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm going to get me some to get him up out of here. That, that is fine as well. So, so that, that, that may not be as dogmatic as you may want. But that is, you know, the, 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 the bent or the... Uh, 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 view, we can say, a scripture. So I'm going to hunk it off right there. I hope that was helpful. I hope that was uh, uh, beneficial. I'm sorry some of these answers just can't be. Yes, th th there are some questions that is just cut and dry, just that smooth. But there's others that take, you know, a bit more of a thorough, exhaustive approach. So I I'll tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to say nothing. Y'all going to be talking about me if I say it. But the point is, I want to protect my home, my family, just like everybody else. I think there's something instinctive about protecting your children, your, your spouse, standing up for yourself, defending yourself, defending your property. I don't think there's anything sinful about that. I worked. I didn't go out and steal. I legally worked by the sweat of my brow. I, I, I saved, I budgeted, and, and, and through God's favor and blessing and, 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 and blessing to get me through school, to get me a better job, to get me a better salary. Now I don't have a job, I have a career, and I have a salary to where I can go buy whatever I want. And somebody just want to take it? I'm not going to let you have it. No, I'm going to be a good steward over what God has blessed me with and protect it. I'm going to be a good steward over my family and protect them. I'm going to be a good steward over these possessions. I'm not materialistic to say I'm not going to let you steal my car. I'm not materialistic for stopping you from stealing my wallet. I'm not materialistic for saying, no, you can't have the TV off my wall. You just broke in my house. I don't think that's selfish or materialistic. It is instinctive to protect what God has given you, mainly your family, and to have a weapon to do that. I don't see in the Bible where God say never do that. That's wrong. So hopefully that was beneficial. Uh, I didn't got bougie, y'all. I didn't start drinking water with cut up strawberries in it.
Y'all please forgive me. But uh, if you do have any more Bible questions, please send them to newhebronlr.org. You can look at the quick links and you'll be able to find um, exactly where to submit those forms. Just as a reminder, this Saturday at 11 a.m. that our own Sister Waller, uh, her family, Sister Waller and her family are going to be having the services for her sister. Uh, it's at Mariana Funeral Home and it's going to be online services via Facebook. Mariana Funeral Home this Saturday, 11 a.m. via Facebook. Facebook. I want to say thank you again or a shout out again to our own Sister Morris, PCSSD, paraprofessional. She is the first in the state to be a certified interverner, beaner. She know what it is. Amen. It's, it's so high tech, I can't even pronounce it. We thank the Lord for her and also for our own Sister Natasha Tim's wife, or Pastor Tim's. She has been elected to be Teacher of the Year for the second year in a row, which is some tall cotton also. So, amen. God bless you and thank you to all. We're going to go ahead and log off now. Be safe. Listen, you better run to the store and get your bread and your milk because if it look like it's going to ice tomorrow, I ain't going nowhere. Thank you, Lord, for PTO. That's what I got it for. So, I hope everybody's doing fine and I hope that God blesses you until we see you again. Amen. Sister David, Sister Burnett, Brother Tim, and Sister Calvin. Good job, Sister Tim and Sister Morris. God bless you.